Good afternoon, class. This is John Van Slyke, and we are here with our first screencast of History 205, an introduction to American environmental history. And today in class, we were talking, trying to set the stage a little bit. We were talking a little bit about how environmental history differs from some of the other frameworks uh, under which history is, is told. Uh, in our our culture. We've talked about more traditional history that pays attention to political developments or economic developments, cultural developments, social developments. There's a whole number of level, a whole number of, I should say, lenses through which the challenge of telling stories and accounting for developments uh, of the past a number of lenses through which those can be looked at. And environmental history is one, and I will argue, a very important one, um, an important lens by which we can look uh, at the past. And uh, our objectives for our time together today were to try to lay a little bit of the uh, foundation for environmental history. And we spoke a little bit about how history might be told in our area, at least using the Umatilla Basin through the experience of salmon. And of course the last couple hundred years have been a very interesting period in time for the Chinook, the wild Chinook salmon of the Umatilla uh, Basin. So we talked a little bit about that and some noteworthy developments uh, such as the Treaty of 1855, the arrival of industrial agriculture in the early 20th century, uh, the uh, the thriving industrial agriculture that characterized much of the 20th century and also demanded quite a bit of water from the Umatilla River Basin and some of the consequences that this had for our uh, regional strains of Chinook salmon. So uh, environmental history is a way of looking at the past that really kind of puts humans as players for sure. We're, we're definitely um, uh, figures in the story, but we're not the only figures, and uh, we really look at the consequences for uh, various uh, members of our natural environment, and in this case we chose uh, Chinook salmon. The other objective that we didn't get to for today was to look at Donald Worster and some of the framework that he uses for uh, looking at environmental history and how we might better uh, uh, meet the task of um, explaining what happened in the past and how that has consequence, consequences for the natural environment. So we'll get back after that. We'll, we'll try to pick up the second objective uh, in my comments here today. Uh, and I'll just slowly flip through these. So if you wanted to pause and refresh any of your notes from earlier today, you can definitely do that. Um, and. Uh, we talked a little bit about stakeholders and interest groups and what salmon can tell us about the past if we only look at the past through the uh, perspective or from the perspective of Chinook salmon. And this, you may want to look at this briefly too. These are some of the developments that um, pertain to the specific stakeholders we looked at earlier today. Okay, so now we're going to be, these are the big four. I talked briefly about them. I mentioned them in class today. And the big four are the um, four environmental historians from which our course and our learning experience together this quarter, we will draw rather extensively from them. And our first of the big four is Donald Worster. And I'm going to be talking today about his three levels of analysis and the three ways in which he stresses environmental history uh, can make more sense. It can be, uh, I guess, a little bit more, we can apply a formula for better understanding and focusing on the important developments of the past that will help give us a greater sense of meaning when we look at environmental history and try to practice environmental history. Okay, so Donald Worster, well, he is currently a professor at the University of Kansas. And in this relatively young field of environmental history, he is one of the uh, more established voices. And that probably helps explain why he is one of the headliners in our course uh, together this quarter. And one of his quotes that I like, and it was in the reading that you read for class today, 
He says, to do environmental history, we must get out of doors and ramble into fields, woods, and the open air. And what I get from this and from Donald Worcester is, you know, environmental history is a history that kind of challenges you to roll up your sleeves and uh, sort of go out and the closer you can get to this um, subject, our natural environment, the subject of environmental history, uh, the better prepared and the better qualified one is to, to speak and tell the story of the past from the perspective of the natural environment. So he's a big proponent of not being afraid to get a little bit dirty and get pretty close and in the trenches with the, the um, subject that you wish to explain. Okay, so three levels. The first of the three levels that Worcester uh, talks about uh, is ecology. And so uh, we can think about this a little bit still in the context of our Chinook salmon. Uh, Donald Worcester believes that in order to be an effective environmental historian, one has to have a pretty good understanding of the ecology of the uh, environment in which one lives. Now, ecology is a big term, and I'm going to simplify it a little bit by just saying that ecology is the study of the relationships between an organism and its natural environment. Okay, When we get later in the course, like week seven or so, we're going to spend a whole week looking at ecology. But essentially ecology is this uh, network. It's uh, the, I should say, networks. It's the relationships that exist between organisms and their environment. So for example, when, uh, you know, one principle of ecology is that when certain populations, let's say in this case, let's say uh, when uh, great blue heron populations grow in number, maybe due to a decline in um, uh, gray fox populations, right? So if they're a natural predator of the great blue heron uh, and a gray, wolf, a gray fox population declines, so the great blue heron populations rise because their natural predators are now um, more limited in their numbers. What could an explosion in great blue heron populations mean for salmon? Well, it may very well mean that that's more salmon fry or, or small salmon minnows that are going to be getting gulped up by these great blue herons, and that could have consequences for uh, salmon populations. Okay, so ecology is important, and ecology isn't just, uh, you know, it, it involves kind of the science of the natural world as well. And this map here on this slide shows you rainfall patterns that exist across the United States. And as you notice right here, this all important 99th parallel, this is a, a line of longitude that roughly cuts the United States in half. This is important because for a vast part of the American interior, this part in here, uh, precipitation levels drop quite a bit. This is uh, essentially, if you get west of this 99th meridian, you start to see large parts of the American landscape that get by with less than 20 inches of rainfall each year. Now you see over here on the west coast where we live that there's actually quite a bit of rainfall. And this has consequences for our salmon, right? There's a reason why salmon tend to be somewhat abundant in this area and not so much in here. Part of it has to do with our landscape and landforms and mountains that provide barriers, but also has something to do with precipitation and in this case the relative lack of precipitation. So on this first level of Worcester's analysis we have to know a little bit about the natural processes. So an environmental historian has to make himself or herself a little bit of a natural scientist so they can understand better some of the relationships between uh, how uh, the natural environment uh, foc uh, functions. Uh, those of you who know a little bit about uh, geography and climate know that there's this other phenomenon known as the rain shadow effect. We know we have these significant mountain landforms along the western edge of the United States. We have the Cascades up here, we have the Sierras down here, and our 
weather largely comes from the west, comes in in this direction, well, when uh, clouds and uh, weather fronts move in from the west and they hit these high mountains along the western coast, they have to drop their cargo. They have to drop their precipitation. And when they do that, that means west of these mountains we get a lot of precipitation. But since those clouds have now dropped their rainfall cargo, as they proceed east, they are much drier. And that helps explain why the interior of the American West tends to be quite dry. We have the Great uh, Basin Desert, the um, uh, Mojave Desert right in here, the Sonoran Desert down here, the Chihuahuan Desert down here. So that's a really dry area and it's largely explainable by the science. We talked a little bit earlier in class about how an uh, environmental historian would want to know a little bit about the life cycle of salmon because that helps explain some of the pop population fluctuations. We also need to know a little bit about the water requirements of salmon. It certainly doesn't hurt us to know a little bit about riparian health, the riparian area being that narrow um, transitional uh, ground between a creek and the, the, the creek bank. There tends to be unique vegetation that grows in that area, and that vegetation has consequences for salmon, right? If we have taller um, and greater cover, uh, tree cover, like cottonwoods and things like that, those are providing shade, which are helping to keep the water cool. Salmon like cooler, colder waters, and if you strip that area, whether it's due to farming or um, grazing of animals, that's going to have negative consequences for our salmon. So we need to know these things, these, these relationships. And Worcester challenges the environmental historian to become at least a passable ecologist. Okay, secondly, uh, we need to know about human modes of production. And what we mean by modes of production is essentially how is it that a certain society meets the challenges of eking out a living, right? So for thousands of years in North America, the way that societies in the area of the Walla Walla and Umatilla River basins, the way they did that was through hunting and gathering. And that mode of production, the mode of produ production that involves hunting and gathering, has much less consequence for the um, uh, health of a watershed or a river system. And if the river system and watershed are more healthy, they're probably more able to uh, meet the needs that uh, wild salmon will have. Well, in our region of the United States, going back, you know, starting a hundred years or so ago, we really switched hard from a hunting and gathering mode of production and then we transitioned to a agricultural mode of production but it was still pretty small scale so it didn't have that great of a consequence for our rivers and therefore our salmon but in the early 20th century starting in the 1920s this area converted to industrial agriculture and that meant that we were providing agricultural produce for a much larger segment of the United States and in order to do that our farmers had a high had a much greater demand upon the uh, water uh, and rivers of the Pacific Northwest. And this has created real challenges for salmon, as evident by the very low numbers of salmon uh, that our uh, Umatilla River uh, uh, experienced in the 1970s. And then finally, we could also include as a mode of production the really uh, uh, technology intensive. Um, industries of the West, like Portland and Seattle. Okay, My third level, I'm going to be short here because I'm running out of time, is the perception, ideology, and values. This is really important. So we need to know how a society, what matters to a society? How do they perceive their world? What is it that they value? And um, we'll talk about this a little bit at the beginning of class tomorrow. But there could almost not be a greater contrast than that one that exists between how native tribes looked at their um, surroundings and the way Anglo-Europeans began to do that. So I will stop there and we'll pick this up a bit tomorrow. I hope you've enjoyed this.
बाय